Hello and welcome to our session on a recovery of 19th century Black histories. Um, this is a very important subject matter and we have three presenters who are doing really ground level work uh, in that area. And so we are very happy to have him, them here today to discuss their uh, various projects, uh, which broadens our knowledge of African-American history because this is only one way um, that we can uh, enlarge that study. So we're very happy today to have with us um, uh, Dee Dee Baldwin, um, Mary Mallard, and Jawan Wu uh, to present. And so we're gonna dive into it right away. We'd ask the audience, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A function. And those questions will be answered after all three presenters have uh, done their presentations. Um, so uh, uh, please um, pay attention and ask lots of questions. Um, well, so we're gonna begin with Didi. Hi everyone, thanks for coming today. Let me share my screen with you. That should pop up for you. Okay, yeah, so my name is Dee Dee Baldwin and I'm the history research librarian at Mississippi State University Libraries. And I have to admit to a little bit of imposter syndrome here because um, I had never considered myself as doing anything related to documentary editing and I never would have thought to um, submit my proposal to a conference like this thinking that it didn't fit or you know something like that but I've been assured that it does so <laughs> I hope that y'all get something out of it and I hope you enjoy it. So what I'm going to be talking uh, to you about today is my website Against All Odds, the first Black legislators in Mississippi which is located at muchado.net slash legislators. And I'm also gonna paste that link into the chat in case anybody wants to go check it out. Um, so this is a digital humanities project that I started. I started doing the research and work on it in 2018. Um, and it started because I'll tell the very brief version of this. I found a headstone at a rural cemetery here in Mississippi with an old headstone flat on the ground for a man named Isom Stewart, who had been born in 1810. And it was an African-American cemetery. And here in Mississippi, we don't usually see headstones that go back that far. And since I'm kind of obsessed with genealogy, I started researching him. And in that process, I found out that he had been a state legislator, which amazed me because, you know, this is a man whose headstone was just flat on the ground and he had been a state legislator. And that got me wondering how many um, black legislators were there during reconstruction. This was something I had never really researched before or considered even. And so I started looking into it and I had a lot of trouble finding information about him. Um, but the more I researched, the more I realized that I was really interested in these men and I wanted to provide a place where people could go to have an easier time finding information than I had. So I created Against All Odds and this is a couple of screenshots from the site. On the left, this is sort of the main format of it. It's just a list of the men's names um, and there was just over 150 and I started off with just the reconstruction legislators, but I ended up expanding it to all of the 19th century uh, legislators. The last two left in 1894. And after 1894, because of Mississippi's Jim Crow Constitution, there would not be another African American legislator in our state government until the 60s. I think 1968, but don't hold me to that. It was in the late 60s. Um, so there's over 150 men in this list. And each one, when you click on his name, it takes you to a profile page where I have a photograph if it was available. And fortunately, quite a few of them do have photographs because these composite photos of the legislature were taken for several years. So I do have quite a number of photographs, which is pretty cool. 
Um, and then they include uh, brief biographies, they include excerpts, um, whatever I was able to find from primary and secondary sources. Um, it includes a ton of newspaper clippings. It's, I haven't counted them in a while, but it's just under a thousand newspaper clippings. And those appear under the bio section. So here in this little left screenshot, that's what the little thumbnails of the newspaper clippings look like. And then when you click on a clipping, I fully transcribed all of them, which took a good while. Um, some There were a few long ones. Most of them were not too long, but it, it still took a good number of months to transcribe all these clippings. And the reason I wanted to do that was there were two main reasons. First of all, it helps these things uh, show up better in search engines. The more search searchable text you have, it really helps you in search engines. And also um, for accessibility, um, people with screen readers or you know, for any other reason, people might have trouble reading that, that newspaper text. Uh, they are fully transcribed and they're also cross-linked. So for example, every time one of the legislators is mentioned in an article, there's a link to his profile page. Um, so that if somebody does come to this page from Google, they'll be able to link over to the legislator uh, that it's talking about. So it also provides um, some context. So it's discoverability, accessibility, and context all kind of mixed together. Um, and so, Last year, the library approached me about creating uh, a digital exhibit version of the site for the Mississippi State Library's um, digital exhibits page, which is done on Omeka. So there's also a mirror site at MSU Libraries, and it includes all of the same content. And it also has a pretty cool advantage where using Omeka's uh, metadata functions, I was able to add things like Library of Congress uh, subject headings, which are all linked. Omeka lets you tag things. So there's also a tag functionality, which is really nice. So it's whenever I add something, new research, or you know, whenever I find something and add it to the site, because it is an ongoing project, um, I update my site. And then I also update the version on MSU's website. So some other cool things that have arisen from this project is our metadata librarian, Lauren Geiger. Um, she approached me about creating Library of Congress authority records for some of these men that amazingly didn't have them already. A few of the more well-known figures did. Um, obviously Hiram Revels, you know, the first African-American Senator in the country, he, he had a, an authority record. But a lot of these men, even some of the relatively prominent ones did not. So for example, this man, Alexander K. Davis, um, he was Mississippi's first black lieutenant governor and also one of the first black lieutenant governors in the country. He did not have a Library of Congress authority record. And I'm just now remembering that I'm not speaking to a bunch of librarians. So authority records are, these are basically what are used as subject headings in library catalogs. They're called authority records, name authorities. And so these have to be submitted through sort of official channels. And so our metadata librarian created these records. Um, she worked with me and uh, I created sort of a priority list, like here are the ones that we really, really most should have records for. And then she went through and added um, these records. And this is something we're still working on, I think so far. She submitted about 16 of them and we're, st we're waiting for the next batch to go through and then she's going to do another batch. And one of the really cool things that has come out of this aspect of it is um, over the last couple of years since doing the site, I've gotten a number of emails from descendants of these men, which is just amazing to me uh, to hear from them. Some of them knew that their ancestors um, had been these important figures and some of them had no idea and they just found it through Google or um, they found where I had posted the men on Ancestry because that's that's another thing I do with the site. I add the men on Ancestry so that people looking for their family history uh, can find them that way. Um, and so when, once these Library of Congress authority records went through, I was able to email some of these people and say, hey, um, your ancestor 
is now an official subject heading in the Library of Congress. And that really touched them. And it was really cool to me to be able to tell them that. So this is something that we're still working on, submitting these subject headings. Another project that came out of it, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with Wikidata from some of the other things you do. And to be totally honest, I don't completely understand Wikidata, um, like how it's used, but I do know that um, search engines, most especially Google, they use Wikidata entries um, in their search engines. And Wikidata entries can also be used um, as one of the sources for creating those Library of Congress subject headings. So Lauren kind of gave me a quick intro to the site and um, I spent a couple of weeks creating Wikidata entries for um, all 150 plus um, of the legislators on the site. And I included their images. I went onto Wikimedia Commons for the ones that have photographs and added um, their images. And um, so all of these also now have Wikidata entries. So for people who know how to use that kind of thing and know how to incorporate it into whatever work they're doing that I don't understand, um, this is now also a resource connected to the site. And so what is the overall point of this? Um, the site was created not just for historians, but also, as you can tell from some of what I've talked about, also for um, family historians. I want it to be accessible to everyone who's interested in researching these men for whatever reasons. And I think of it as a form of um, archival reparations or restoration. Um, and I'm not gonna read this quote to you that's here on the slide, but Anna Robinson Sweet um, published a really important article in 2018 called Truth and Reconciliation archivists as reparations activists. Um, and she pointed out the critical role that archives play, not only in documenting history, but that archi archives are necessary in the reparations movement because obviously they document these things that happened uh, to certain people. And so whenever you have human rights abuses around the world, archives have a really central pivotal uh, role in making sure that the necessary historical documentation has been done in order to make those reparations happen. Um, and it's also a form of information reparations, um, not just monetary and um, what you would think of as justice, but also, um, I, I guess, more of a uh, more of an abstract concept of informational reparations, if that makes sense. And then Kim Gallen, also an equally important article, uh, making a case for the Black digital humanities. Again, I'm not going to read this text to you that's on the slide, but this part that I highlighted, the project of recovering lost historical and literary texts should be foundational to the Black digital humanities. And so this is something that I think librarians, archivists, historians, documentary editors, like some of y'all um, can participate in and make history available to, um, to anyone who's, who's looking for it that might not otherwise find it. And that's a really um, important role that we all kind of uh, fulfill in our in our different ways. So here's my contact information. Um, if you would like a copy of these slides um, because of the links in it, you know, or you just want to look at some of it again, just feel free to email me. Um, there's also a link at the bottom and you could search YouTube for this, but I did a panel with two of the men's descendants for the Society of Mississippi Archivists uh, back in May. And um, that was a really cool experience. Most of it is just them talking about their ancestors, which is what's awesome. Um, so if you are interested in that, that's there too. So if you, if you want a copy of these slides to look at these links, just send me an email. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, I will be available for the Q&A after everyone has presented. Thanks. Thanks, Dee Dee. What an interesting presentation. So we're gonna go uh, over to Mary um, with her presentation. 
Thank you. And hi, everyone. I'll just share my screen here. Nine years ago, my research led me to a small private collection of rare 19th century letters, photographs, an autograph album, property deeds, school certificates, and Bible records belonging to an African-American family with deep roots in Philadelphia. Ranging from the 1830s to the early 1900s, the Webb family papers have considerable literary, cultural, and historical importance. Any antebellum handwritten letter penned by an African-American is enormously valuable and quite rare. Personal correspondence written by Northern Black women before the Civil War is almost unheard of. Using a selection of early letters from the Webb family papers and a few documents from other collections as a structural lens, I have created a small scale edition of 18 letters that shows how Annie Wood negotiated the precarious paths of education, friendship, courtship, marriage, motherhood, and inheritance during a time when women, especially women of color, enjoyed few rights. My goal is to collaborate with an archival institution that has a solid digital infrastructure and high visibility so that these letters and the story they tell can reach as many people as possible. The title of this presentation is taken from a love letter, one of eight that Annie Wood wrote on the eve of her marriage to John G. Webb in 1854. These letters are the earliest known African-American courtship correspondence and have much to offer scholars interested in the ways that race, class, and gender intersect in the romantic lives of elite young women in the Black Atlantic. A question for future scholars who view these letters will be, how much do the letters adhere to prescribed courtship rituals and follow the conventions of the genre of courtship letters, and how much are they the product of the writer's individual situations? The courtship letters contain original poetry as well as literary quotations from published sources and are written in a highly romantic style reflecting the writer's education, religiosity, and popular Victorian sentiments. Here's an example from one of Annie Wood's 1854 letters to John G. Webb. Quote, your very name hath been sacred to me. Oh, I cannot describe the thrilling sympathy which seemed to bind my soul to thee, wherever I wandered, whatever I pursued. You mistake my meaning when you think I consider myself in possession of so many other resources of this than love. No, no, love is the only resource. And she's, of course, has underlined love. Um, the transcriptions of these letters written in the 1840s and 1850s have proved to be extremely challenging because of their fragile condition and because some are undated fragments. In spite of these drawbacks, the letters tell us much about Annie's relationships with men. Her distant father, her closest friend who sees himself as a protective brother, her adoptive brother who sees himself as a beau, and John Webb, her wandering fiance and husband. Identifications of the people mentioned in the letters have been equally challenging and have required constructing complex family charts like this one that focus on in-law and cousin relationships, which often form the basis of antebellum social life. Ancestry.com has been essential for my identifications along with parish records, newspapers, and school records. When there's been no secondary source to consult, which is often, the identification process has been long and laborious, sometimes taking years. My goal is to identify everyone mentioned in the letters as part of a larger project that recognizes overlapping social networks. Photographs and their inscriptions, if there are any, have been essential resources, not only for providing identifying information, but to be displayed as visual components to a digital edition. Unidentified photographs in a single family collection like the web papers are both a challenge and potentially a rich resource for expanding our understanding of family and social connections. Dating photographs through their subjects clothing and hair fashion, researching the activity of photographers and photography studios, linking photographs to uh, missing family members or friends, all of this has broadened the range of my research. <clears throat> 
The Webb Family Papers Collection has a close archival kinship with the Stevens Cogdell Sanders Venning Collection at the Library Company of Philadelphia. It also speaks to and intersects with the Christian Fleetwood Papers at the Library of Congress, the Francis Grimke Papers at Howard University, the Hayes Collection at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and the Colored Conventions Movement Project. It connects tangentially to the Anna Julia Cooper collection at Howard insofar as both concern the life of Charlotte Fortin. If you excuse me just a moment, I'm going to change slides. Um, much of Annie Wood's recovered biography has evolved from my earlier archival research conducted outside the Webb family papers. I am indebted to the scholarship of Julie Winch, who wrote the biography of James Fortin and edited Joseph Wilson's 1840 sketches, 1841, I'm sorry, sketches at the higher classes of Colored Society in Philadelphia. Uh, Dorothy Porter Wesley's edition of the selected writings of William Cooper Nell. Brenda Stevenson's edition of Charlotte Fortin's journals and John Zemer's architectural history, Hayes, the plantation and its people. Without these scholars attention to certain tiny puzzling details, I might never have looked for and found Annie Webb. I have drawn on that earlier research to place this small edition into historical context and to write annotations and an introduction. Biographical sketches of some of Annie Wood's family members appear in my edition of Louisa Jacobs letters. This slideshow is a pictorial draft of my introduction to the edition, and I hope it will illustrate the power of one individual story to eliminate 19th century black women's history and culture. And I just wanna say before I start that everyone pictured in these slides is African-American with the exception of Annie Wood's father, her lawyer and Samuel J. May. Asterisks in the captions indicate those people who are mentioned in the edition.
Wow, what fascinating um, work that you've been doing. Um, now we're gonna go on to Ji Won Wu because we wanna come back and ask lots of questions I know. Ji Won. Hi, um, <laughs> thank you for the video. I'm just thinking about the photos and music. So let me share my screen here. So thank you everybody for making this wonderful conference happening. Uh, it's been an inspiring month. My name is Jeon Woo and I teach American American literature at the Lorain County Community College in Ohio. Um, at the Memorial Day ceremony held in an affluent suburb in, of the Cleveland this year, a 77 year old veteran was invited to speak he began to explain the origin of the day, which was about the formerly enslaved people in Charleston, South Carolina, who had honored the Black Union soldiers. Then his mic was abruptly turned off, not accidentally, but intentionally. The event organizer believed the centering Black experience on the national holiday was inappropriate. This incident exemplified how Black absence from the archive has happened. The deletion of a black presence in historical record is performed intentionally and deliberately. Indeed, it is not absent as if African Americans chose to opt themselves out of history, but it is the deletion by white violence that removed the black people from historic record. Even if their presence remains, it is trivialized as racial tokenism in a way of embellishing white mainstream historiography. For this one way of the DH practices to highlight African American autonomy by centering Black authored document. The US, US Census recorded Black citizens in Ohio only for taxation before 1850. Therefore, those who did not have property, like new settlers, women, and children, were often omitted from the census. Few studies about early Black Ohioans have filled the gap providing a glimpse of how African-Americans lived in 19th century Ohio. However, because these studies are mostly done by white historians who had resources of research and publication, black people's own voices often mediated by these historians. For example, Charles Thomas Hickox, the Negro in Ohio, 1802 to 1870, is one of the pioneering study about black Ohioans. But this book calls them some prominent colored men, fugitive slaves, or Negroes in most cases without ever mentioning their names. Their namelessness, despite being the main subject of the book, is hardly unnoticeable. Like the delivery obfuscation of African American voice, in historiography, happens in two ways uncritically using only official document in the past when Black people could barely access them and replicating the practice of this document in the present. We tend to prioritize the racially exclusive nature of this text by pointing out the lack of remaining Black authored record while canonizing white text and generating whitewashed historiography. In our digital age, we must be careful not to repeat this practice as Rupika Rissam argues, Colonialism within the cultural record is not only being reproduced, but it but is also being amplified by a virtue of the fact that digital cultural record is constructed and disseminated publicly online in a digital milieu beset with its own politics of identity. The Colored Conventions Movement, as one of the exemplary Black-centered DH project, compels us to see the difference between the data of the convention delegate locations and the underground railroad locations reported by a white historian. As Jim Casey reminds us, data visualization is a useful tool for generating new questions, which disrupt the linear narrative of white-centered American historiography. Mapping and data visualization project can help us discover the previously hidden or less visible resume of violence and power. At the same time, this emergence of violence and power also makes their target explicit as well. Likewise, 
when we quantify archives with the digital tools, we can find a humanistic mode of inquiry to decenter and reconfigure the grammar of American historiography. Here, I want to offer examples to show what data can reveal and implicate. I compare the data from two sources. One is a recent book about early Black settlement in Ohio, and another is a history book newspaper, The Palladium of Liberty, which was based on Columbus and published in 1844. While both of them allow us to observe the early history of African Americans in the state, they demonstrate the stark contrast about the narratives about Black communities. Let me start with what Black experience depicted in the white document looked like. When I say white document here, I mean the historiography that depends on white storytelling, legitimize their record, and preserve record about non-white people within the frame of a white experience. White documents rarely pay attention to subjectivity and autonomy of people of color as if they could not have told their own stories. I take David Mayer's and Ellis Mayer's history of Black settlement of Ohio as an example of a whitewashed history of a Black experience. I use this book to show the common practice within and outside of the academia that reinforced the white center's discourse on Black history. Let me make it clear. I don't intend to depreciate their effort to honor the history of early Black settlement because their contribution to understanding African American history is crucial to opening further studies of not only Black Americans, but also methodology itself to historicize underrepresented groups. Rather, I use data from this book to show how so called last minute document trivialize a Black people's own record which result in the omission and misrepresentation of them. Those with the authority of documentation of early Black Ohioans consist of white enslaver individuals, wills, letters, legal transactions, court record, and government papers. As these documents were mostly written by those with power and entitlement, the book reproduced the white perspective on Black experience. Each chapter has a similar pattern of narrative. A benevolent enslaver decides to manumit and help his human properties settle in the nearby free state, Ohio. Formerly enslaved people named a new land after their enslaver and began to cultivate the land. But because of never seizing white violence, most of them left the place and eventually the settlement was taken over by white settlers. For example, John Randolph of Virginia granted his enslaved people freedom as well as funds for the settlement after his death in 1845. His executor, Josie William Lee, authorized the purchase of the sun land for Randolph freed people, and Samuel J. helped secure 3,200 acres in central West Ohio. In 1846, nearly 400 people from the Randolph plantation arrived on the land with a white contractor, Thomas Caldwell, who dealt with the local whites. Nevertheless, the black settlers met severe white pushback on the migration to Ohio about a century after their settlement was founded, black residents pretty much finished. This is a founding story of a Roseville settlement in Miami County. In short, this narrative mistakenly centered the white enslaver on Black history, reinforcing the truth of the white savior and hero individual. Accordingly, early Black settlers are portrayed as passive and dependent on white enslavers' continuous support. So here's uh, some uh, visualization of the map. So you can spot the uh, enslavers who send their enslaved people to Ohio. And next interactive map is their route to Ohio. And then the size of the circles indicate the size of the community. And in the last um, the map, I coupled with uh, the early settlement with the current black population in Ohio. So darker gray indicate more black population. So these maps compel us to ask, didn't the early settlers collaborate beyond the boundary of each settlement? In considering the Black Americans populated in urban areas rather than in rural ones, 
when and how did they happen? When did they change their last names taken from enslavers? How could we keep tracing their origins? These data based on the white narrative fail to offer answers. However, when we center marginalized documents like a short-lived pamphlet on Black Americans' conventions and Black newspapers and visualize them through digital tools, early Black communities appear independent, self-sustainable, and growing through collaboration. In explicitly shifting the focus from the enslavers to the Black settlers, we can delineate the vibrant communal life of African Americans in Ohio. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Columbus based new black newspaper, Palladium of Liberty, was published by a businessman and activist, David Jenkins. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but this newspaper was a product, not by his individual effort, but by a communal work. Black delegates and attendees at state conventions of Black citizens of Ohio decided and planned for its publication. And a number of Dutch agents voluntarily worked to collect news and recruit subscribers. When white newspapers failed to deliver news for and about Black Americans, the newspaper list its more than 100 agents in the total 33 issues, detailing the locations of them. These agents reveal where Black communities were built in the mid-19th century Ohio. I mine the data from the list of them and their locations, as you can see here. So first, the narrative map shows their locations and centering the, um, the Palladium of Liberties office in Columbus. And you can see not only in the state, but this stretches beyond the state. In the same way, I coupled with the two maps. One is the location of the agent and then current black population in Ohio. And different from the previous one, you can see the those maps are kind of coupled each other. So what the black newspaper demonstrate about early black communities is that while African Americans settled in rural areas, their settlements clustered around urban centers. They collaborated to rebuild their self-sustainable and democratic communities beyond their immediate vicinities throughout the state, despite the notorious Black law and other institutional attempts to dismantle their settlement. This contrasts with the other book's observation about early Black settlement in Ohio. This last map shows that the data from Black newspaper corresponds to the current Black population in Ohio. Of course, we should not assume that any Black authored document might always represent Black experience more accurately than recorded by white observers and historians. Nevertheless, these documents like Black newspapers disrupt the white-centered colonial narrative of American historiography because they corroborate Black presence against the forces that attempt to reduce it to embellish the narrative. Although early Black settlers' stories have faded into oblivion as white framed documentations fail to record them, Black Ohioans practiced community building and demonstrated their democratic citizenry in the 19th century Ohio. As we see here, digital recovery and its open accessibility to archive contribute to a center of historical discourse from white individuals to Black collectives. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, what we've had here is three really disparate studies um, of African Americans and um, how they were recovered. So we want to thank Mary, um, Joan, and Didi for their uh, work. I hope that you have some questions um, from the audience. Um, and uh, I have one um, question um, to Didi, uh, which says this project is wonderful. Um, can you talk more about the recent interview between descendants uh, Karen Birch and Bianca Ford? 
Absolutely. Um, so Karen Birch is a descendant of George Washington Albright. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I had some sound going. I was calling up the video to link to it. Um, yeah, so Karen Birch was a descendant of George Washington Albright and Bianca Ford was a descendant of uh, Emmanuel Handy. Uh, George Washington Albright, he ended up in Los Angeles. Uh, he, like a lot of these men, uh, he left Mississippi uh, after, after his term in the legislature. And um, his family was really interesting. Some of his descendants helped uh, Japanese Americans who had been sent to the internment camps during World War II. So there's a whole interesting story there. But yeah, um, in a second in the chat, I'll paste a link to that video for people who might be interested in looking at it. Uh, but Karen and Bianca are both wonderful and they, they tell very interesting stories. Okay, uh, and for Mary, um, the question is, uh, I'm fascinated by the complex familia and social networks you're illuminating. Can you talk more about the challenges and reward of this research? Um, well, the rewards uh, are infinite. <laughs> um, I, and it expands, it just goes on and on for years and years. So, um, uh, and, and it is adding, adding to our knowledge of African-American life in the 19th century. Um, the challenges, um, you know, there are, there are so many gaps and um, I, I, I do see linking these social circles and family circles. And I do uh, think that uh, family networks were far more important in the 19th century than, um, than they are maybe than they were in the 20th and 21st century. Although um, I also like Dee Dee contacted descendants and um, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, looking at this older lady's address book, she was still in touch with the descendants of the cousins from the 1830s and 1840s. Um, and um, so I think it's a real key to um, understanding the culture of the time. Um, one of the things that I haven't come to terms with yet, because I'm not sure, but we all have situations where we're related to people and we're in a social network and some people don't get along. Um, I'm able to establish social circles, but I don't really know if those people all liked each other. I don't, I can't really make the assumptions that there is uh, influence. I think there is some influence. Um, and that's just sort of the uh, you know, sort of dirty laundry that I would like to get into that I'm not going to find in correspondence, um, especially in um, these gentlemanly and ladylike uh, people that I'm looking at. Um, so yes, rewards. Um, and I, I would invite any researchers uh, to get into this and to follow this methodology of looking at family circles and social circles and how they overlap. And in this particular case, it's, it's from city to city. We're looking at uh, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and we see those families moving literally on mass uh, in the 1870s and 1880s to Washington, DC. Um, and so that links very nicely with a lot of scholarship that is happening right now around the turn of the century um, with um, uh, the uh, Black Women's Club movement, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a lot of the activity that was happening in Washington. Um, I, anyway, that's all I have to say on that at the moment. Well, well Mary, um, the work you're doing, um, are you annotating the letters? Um, is that the work that you are currently doing and want to publish? Yes. And, um, and the decisions I have to make is, is the depth of the annotations. Um, I tend to go deep. Um, and uh, in the past, what I've done, when I've done with my annotations, I tend to pull a lot of that information back out and into an, an introduction. It helps me form my introduction. Um, but I'm, you know, for more information we have, the better, even if it's just a little, uh, it's seen seemingly insignificant footnote, it's going to be valuable to someone else. And uh, the scholars that I mentioned who had influenced me, those were footnotes. Those were, just those were just a mention of the name, either Annie Wood or Mary Wood. And that left an opening for me to do further research. So I'm, I'm, I'm really for comprehensive <laughs> annotations. Um, but they do expand into full on biographical sketches which is what happened with the Louisa Jacobs edition. Um, so that, yes, that's what I'm working on. And 
you're you're juggling all those balls at the same time but at the moment i'm working on the annotations and the introduction yep great work um for juan and dd Dee Dee, it's interesting that there are intersection between your projects in the editor of the palladium of liberty david jenkins are you aware of any other intersections based on your talk uh juan do you want to start with that one yeah, this is very interesting intersection and uh, that happens whenever we study any figure of the um, African American history. And um, the other document I analyze here, they describe as if black people, they were implanted in this state, but actually African Americans, they're always on the move, even though the movement does not always mean their freedom. So th their movement reveals how much they collaborated and interconnected to construct the black civil rights and defend their um, the rights as a citizen. And um, I think the, the one of the example we can see how they are interacted, how they collaborated is the Colored Commission movement because the delegate list that always reveals, oh, unexpected person is here together and they must have some conversation at the convention. So yeah, those kind of uh, the intersection is always happened when we study Black Archive. Right, Didi, do you wanna chime in? Sure, um, I'm not aware of any more intersections, but there were other Mississippi legislators who ended up moving. Uh, to Ohio, so I'm sure there's probably others that would probably show up in um, Jawan's work. I'm interested um, if I could ask a question, a quick question, I think, is Jawan, what MAP program do you use? I'm sorry, I missed the last part. <laughs> uh, what MAP, what mapping program do you use? Oh, I used a couple of them. I used a stream map J, the JS and then Tableau recently. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, I wanted to know that too, because that's very, very interesting, the way that you've mapped them and um, the mass migration. And of course, the convention material is really kind of interesting to see how many people from a number of different states participated in that and new people in, um, you know, all over the United States. Um, this is for Didi. Um, what are the advantages or disadvantages of maintaining your project on your own site and as a digital exhibit in Omega? Might you consider maintaining only one location? And if so, what would lead you to do so? Um, it, it takes a little bit of time to update both sites at the same time, but to me, it's worth it. Um, I like having the version of the site that's the original version that's still under my auspices, but I also um, like having the version at MSU because it, it adds the additional Omeka features like tags and subject headings and it also um, gives it more of an official air because sometimes students are researching papers and their teachers might give them um, certain limitations on what kinds of websites they can use and I think their teachers are more likely to tell them they can use a university library's website as a source so uh, there's benefits to both of them. So as long as I have the time, I'm going to keep them both up. Uh, so you said that you're continuing um, with the project. Where where is the uh, projection? Uh, what are you working on now for the website? Um, well, I'm always trying to find more information. There's some of the men that I haven't been able to find anything on still. There's like a little handful of three or four that I can't even find on a census. So I'm always kind of going back and trying again, you know, bashing my head against that brick wall. I never get tired of it. Um, so I, I try to I try to keep finding information on them. Um, I'm hoping to be able to make some archives visits um, in the future now that COVID is over, um, some nearby archives, especially the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Um, and they have some governor's papers from Civil War and Reconstruction governors. And they actually have a really great digital project right now that they're in the process of digitizing and transcribing all of those governor's letters. Currently, they're still in the Civil War, but I'm helping with that so we can hopefully get more quickly to the Reconstruction governors, because I'm hoping there's a lot of letters in there uh, that mention these guys. 
well, just a fun fact, as you call it, Dee Dee, I'm a Mississippian. And uh, I happened to work on the campaign of Robert G. Clark, who was the uh, Black legislature, legislator who won, uh, was the first one to win. Uh, wow. Yeah, isn't that an uh, 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 interesting fun fact? So that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, can the Webb family papers be accessed by scholars? Mary? Uh, please soon. Um, um, they are in transit, or actually they're housed at um, the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, the legal part of it is not complete yet. And, um, and then they would need to be processed. And hopefully they are. There's some pre-processing going on right now. I, I have been wanting them to be available for quite a long time. Um, and, uh, but it is, it's a long and quite a complicated process. Um, so they will be available, and I'm tentatively saying that is that's the institution that they'll be at. Um, this is a question for everyone. Uh, you are coming from different fields, literature, history, library science, and archival uh, studies. It feels as if uh, this is a moment when fields are blurring. Uh, what do you think? Juwan, you want to pick that one up? <laughs> I was called, but uh, I have to say, whenever I do any research in the historical document, I have a huge respect for historians and librarians. I mean, their invisible labor is everywhere. And I don't think that they have enough credit for it. So even though I have my own project, but it never be my individual work at all, it could be possible on the foundation of what history and the librarians did before. <laughs> so this kind of um, blurred uh, moment is happened all the time and I delightfully take it and take a benefit from it. At the same time, when we go back to the, the issues about dramas and canonization of the African-American literature. And many African-American writers, they already blurred those boundaries. And for instance, like Mary L in the Mary's presentation, she wrote to her husband, a novelist, and they performed, and then they visualize the literature on the stage at the same time, give the message of the abolitionism. And all those history of what they left in the document tells this blurred boundaries necessary for our approach to the African American literature and history. Yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly, yes. And um, historians would be nothing without librarians uh, by their side. So yes. Uh, Mary, you want to uh, speak to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, really, uh, this kind of work is open to librarians and archivists, historians, uh, literary scholars, genealogists, family historians. Um, I, I it seems to me that a lot of the um, at recovery of African-American biography is being done with literary scholars. Um, and it's nice to see everything opening up. I, I just considered it a stroke of really good luck that um, Annie Wood's brother-in-law was the novelist, Frank J. Webb. And, and I'm just gonna say here, um, I did a really close reading of that novel, which is the second American novel in 1857, um, using the methodology of Jean Fagan Yellen when she um, found all of the real people that were in Harriet Jacobs' uh, Fugitive Slave Narrative. And I felt that there were um, autobiographical elements in there. It's not an autobiography in the same way. It's very clearly fiction. It's quite theatrical. It's a comedy of manners. Uh, but I felt that the clues, I, ha I had nothing. And my first information actually came from that book. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I did was try to reconfigure the family in that novel, assuming that that same configuration of brothers and sisters occurred in the Webb family. It took a long time to prove that, but it was so gratifying. And then as all the other things sort of clicked into place, one of the wonderful things in that novel is um, the, the mother uh, works all her life as a housekeeper for a very rich 
family in Philadelphia in the novel. She's Mrs. Thomas. In real life, she's Mrs. Joshua Fisher. And when I made that connection, everything fell into place. There was way more autobiography in that novel. Um, so I was thankful that I had the literary reference, but um, I think we do. That's something we need to do is to go back to the literary output in the middle and late 19th century and look for autobiography. Um, authors at the time were trying to present realism. And where were they pulling those details from? I think we can find a lot from that. Yes. Yeah. Didi, what do you think? Uh, you started your presentation talking about you never thought that you would be, you know, included in a, in a field such as documentary editing. And uh, now you're not only in documentary ed editing, but you're in history and you're, you know, in literature, you're in biography. So what do you think about that? Um, for me, the line blurring is sort of, uh, sort of taking a, a different kind of maybe more proactive role. Um, I think in for librarian librarians, we think of ourselves more as guiding people to work that's already been done, um, and just like an information um, guide. But uh, with this project, I'm taking on more of a proactive role of creating the place that people would go to, and I think that as we try to, the library field and archives field right now is really battling, you know, the racial disparities, like I think a lot of um, industries and professions are. Um, and so this is a way to me of um, helping uh, make that correction by not just um, ho holding people's hands and taking them to the information, but trying to put that information out there myself. Brave work in Mississippi. Uh, especially. <laughs> uh, um, any more questions or comments? Um, do you guys have any questions for each other? I, I love uh, the kind of interaction and that blurred field uh, or blurred lines uh, would, was a wonderful question that uh, connects all of you. Any other questions that you'd like to know from each other? Because uh, you, you did not know each other before you came to this presentation. And it was so fascinating how your work kind of just dovetailed to each other and, um, and actually looking at documentary editing in um, a different aspects of it of what one could do and this uh, different aspect of documentary editing. As Dee said, I didn't know what I was doing was that. Uh, but uh, now I understand it, it falls within that. And I love that Jawan is um, doing close reading of, um, of materials about African-Americans and kind of comparing that with the African-American voice. I, I, I really, really kind of love that because um, I don't know anybody else that's really doing that work quite that well. And so um, your research in, in um, Ohio, I think is gonna be on a cutting edge. And Mary, the all of the connections that you find, and especially to our founding fathers, when you say Aaron Burr, everybody just kind of sat up and said, oh, <laughs> what is that guy doing there? And then, you know, the brother who went off and uh, passed as a, as a Spaniard, as, as many um, uh, African-Americans who had mixed blood did uh, during that period of time. So it's, it's, it's great. So um, while I'm running my mouth, I, two other questions have come in. <laughs> um, several of you mentioned descendants. Are, you, are there any personal stories that can come to light that you would feel comfortable sharing? Um, um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to um, call attention again to that one story I mentioned about George Washington Albright's descendants in Los Angeles helping their Japanese neighbors um, during the time of the internment camps. I thought that was amazing. Um, all of his family that ended up in Los Angeles, they ended up as really cool people. Um, one of his, I think it was his great granddaughter, um, ended up as a, um, um, a public school. She was one of the first African-American public school teachers in Los Angeles County, and she ended up um, 
starting an after school program for kids. So she did amazing work. Um, so just pretty much all of his family did awesome stuff. Did did you touch when did when did they did they migrate from Mississippi to Los Angeles? Was it a part of the Pep Singleton's um, a movement in the 1890s? It wasn't part of that. Um, he left, if I remember right, in the late 1870s. Um, oh, okay. Things in Mississippi started getting really bad in around 1875. The white people, you know, started rioting and stuff because they were mad about black people being in politics. And people started getting threatened, and even there were even some legislators that were lynched and killed. Um, so a lot of these legislators moved. Um, he went to, oh no, he went to Kansas first, and then he went to Los Angeles in the early 1890s. I think is when they bought their homestead there. Very good, um, Mary. Oh, I was just going to say that um, there's been some resistance um, among conservative. Uh, some historians about um, these descendants of Aaron Burr. Um, and I found um, actual documentary proof uh, at the Library of Congress in the Christian Fleetwood papers. And it was this choice gem that I was saving as the last thing that I was going to present to this, these descendants that I met for the first time. And, um, and after presenting them with evidence of their North Carolina air, um, origins and the North Carolina governor and all of that. And when I finally said, and you're a descendant of, of Aaron Burr and they went, oh yeah, we know. And it was, <laughs> it was the same with their cousins. So all, all of these descendants have always known. And um, it, it just, it makes me sad that they weren't believed or, you know, that this, you know, I mean, there's actually people that are, uh, you know, insisting on DNA tests and so on. And um, um, yeah, so anyway, the, the, the descendants were very, very uh, cooperative with me in sharing information. Um, I, and also with oral history, it's really important to this work. Uh, I had a couple of theories um, about things and just a couple of stories came out from descendants that just really didn't relate to anything. One um, descendant, remembered stories that she was told by her grandfather and she was a little girl she was the eldest in the family so she's a little girl remembering these things and they didn't have context they were just these little crystals of information and when she shared one of them with me which was about North Carolina and the uh, rescue of Annie by her fiance and she is you know taken out of the mansion house and you know whisked off back to Philadelphia, it fit with another story I had that, that couldn't be corroborated. Um, so uh, it's, it's been fantastic working with the families. And just, uh, um, we're looking at a span of 250 years here and we're looking at the story of America when we have the founding fathers there. It's right there at the beginning and it's coming all the way through. And it's a story, an amazing story of accomplishment. Um, of these people and um, it was, um, it just all uh, came to a beautiful flowering for me when I met the descendants. It just, you know, it, it, it has a lot of spiritual meaning for me actually. Thank you, Mary, uh, you're doing great work. Um, the last question um, uh, is to Didi about uh, what institutions can do to support um, work like yours. Uh, because when I was looking at the, that you were doing Mississippi, I wondered what your counterparts uh, in the other southern states, uh, you know, uh, although, you know, anybody doing that kind of research, say in Alabama or Georgia or Tennessee. Um, I'm not aware of anybody else doing a project like this, but I do know that um, some of my colleagues at other southern universities are doing a lot of work in Black digital humanities. Um, and just on the spot, I can't recall any offhand, but I know that a lot of great work is being done in that area. But as far as I know, I'm the only one doing legislators. Um, and the institution, Mississippi State University Libraries, they've been really, really supportive of my work on this. Um, they know I spend a lot of time on it and they're fine with it. They think it's great. That's good, that's good. Um, I think we only have uh, a couple of minutes left. Um, correct. Um, and we want to thank Juwan Wu for her presentation um, and Mary Mallard 
and Dee Dee Baldwin. Um, so we have one minute left. Uh, anything to say to, to round us out? We are all looking forward to your research being published and um, you giving more presentations um, in um, places like the Association for Documentary Editing, because that's the only way that, you know, we who are out in the vineyards find out um, about your work one way or the other. So now that I know your name and where you are, I'll keep following it and I keep on pushing Dee Dee Baldwin to get some of the other states to do the, the black legislators uh, doing reconstruction. Cause I think that is so such an important kind of project to kind of do. And maybe she'll write another grant uh, in order with her, uh, with, with others to actually start that as well. So thank you all for um, uh, this session, join us in the session and um, I'll turn it over to uh, our administrators. Have a good evening.